<laughs> Greetings, citizens. You're now trapped in a nerd cage with your hosts, Mark and Jay. We hope you have a smashing good time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, hello and welcome. That's right, you're trapped in Nerd Cage Live. This ain't just a reaction show, but a debate show and a live discussion on everything that makes people like you and I tick. So thank you for joining us tonight. I am your co-host, Jay St. G, coming to you live from Syracuse, New York, and always with me, my man, The Fiend from Louisville, Mark. What's shaking, boss? Hey, what's going on, man? Super excited to be here as usual, but I am more than excited because this week we got some phenomenal news. I'm sure that a lot of people out there have heard that, but, but in case you haven't, um, Michael Keaton, the original cinematic Batman from 1989, uh, is actually in talks with Warner Brothers as we speak to revise his his role uh, to be in the new Flash movie, which I think is I, I think it's a dream for a lot of people. <laughs> I did not believe you. I thought it was a joke. You messaged me. You were the first to right. tell me I was at work. You told me, and honest to God, I did not believe. I'm like I'm like oh come on, like I'm just saying it, it sounds like a fan rumor and then I went on to the internet and the internet was broken yep. every legit site variety Hollywood reporter superhero hype everybody was breaking the news and I'm like oh my god it's actually for real right and the the story like it originally like broke in the rap I think yeah and um you know I wasn't super familiar with that uh, as a as a trade and so you know I don't know if you remember I messaged you I was like is is the rap like for real are they like a rumor site are they for real but then like a few minutes later the Hollywood Reporter started yep. uh reporting it Deadline yep. um, Variety everyone and so you know it's like it's almost like too good to be true yeah <laughs> in a way. Um, and then the funny thing is uh uh, again, we are John Campia fans here, and yes. he was planning on taking hiatus, and all of a sudden, with this news broke, he had a, he put up a video. Right. So it's just like, and then everybody, every single uh, entertainment talk site from Beyond the Trailer and Popcorn the Planet, IGN, everybody. I'm just like, I'm like, all right, I can, and I couldn't wait to listen to what they all had to say, so that way we can we can chime in to see to talk about what no one else is talking about, and for starters, the the thing I'm shocked about is Michael Keaton has been pretty vocal, especially in the 90s. He was very vocal about how he did not enjoy playing Batman. Right. He hated it. He hated the suit. He refused to come back for Batman forever. He clearly didn't enjoy himself, um, especially, in, especially in Batman Returns. And then if you're familiar with the movie uh, uh, Birdman, which is right. great, by the way. I, I That was a great movie. I almost cried when he didn't win the Oscar for that. Um, but Bird, the Birdman clearly was making fun of his opinion on Batman and how he felt about it. Right. And I'm just and I'm just baffled that more than 30 years later, after all the stuff about what he said about the role and how how rough it was for him, and and now all of a sudden he wants to that he's possibly in talks of coming back. Scratch, it makes me scratch my head a little bit. Right, and I'm, and I'm with you with that. So that was one of the things that I did think about when I first read that initial article, because I do remember like, you know, Birdman coming out in 2014, and he absolutely, you know, I sort of looked at that as him skewering uh, his, his past as far as playing Bruce Wayne slash Batman. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when I thought about it, you know, I started thinking about, well, what would be the reasons for him to be, you know, to to be so against uh, playing this character, you know, what would what would what would the experience have been like? It must have not so much been the uh, the the overall you know experience of just playing this character because he put so much into that character that I think other actors have been have then taken and kind of run with to make their own version of Batman. Yeah, the voice, for example, the two different voices. That was a that was a hundred percent his idea. You know, yeah. uh, he approached Tim Burton one one day and said, you know, I think there's like a dichotomy between the you know Bruce uh, Bruce Wayne's personality and Batman, and so I think that I should give 
Bruce Wayne a completely different voice than Batman. That was all him. And everybody that's come after him has like kind of done that. So, um, you well, know- not George Clooney. Well, not George Clooney. I feel like he, <laughs> that, that dude kind of just phoned it in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but every, everybody ben that's kind of taken the I like what seriously. they did with Ben Affleck's version where he just, he had a, a voice changer. Right. Do it, which, but that was brilliant. Like, right, that was brilliant. But, you know, getting back to getting back to the, the idea of why he might not have liked, um, you know, playing Batman over time, I think it might have had more to do with the experiences behind the scenes, right? Yeah. So with those first two uh, Batman movies, actually, I think with that first run, that first franchise, you had a guy that was um, that was in place as far as uh, one of the producers named John P John Peters. And that guy is notorious. You know, you hear stories about him all the time about him coming in and kind of interfering with the, with the original concept of a project, kind of insisting on certain things happening. And so I could see that wearing on an actor or a director. Yeah. And that would explain a lot to me as far as why uh, Michael Keaton would leave after the second one, why Tim Burton would, would not want to have anything to do with the third and fourth uh, movies. And so, you know, when I think about that, then it makes perfect sense for him to not be averse to returning to the role if players like that were not in place. You yeah. know, you have Andy Machete, uh, you know, developing this Flash movie. And, you know, he, you know, for all we know, you know, the people that are in place, he might feel a lot more comfortable with. And he might say, okay, look, let's give this, let's yeah. give this thing another shot. And I think another thing too to add to everything that we were saying earlier was um, obviously the Arrowverse and the Crisis on Infinite Earths. Right. Obviously, I think that was DC's way of testing the waters to see how people would react to multiple Batman, multiple Superman, and this, this, and that. Okay. And they're thinking, you know, I didn't watch it, but I know you had your opinions on it. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, we'll sort of leave those, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but the are. thing is, for the most, but the, the general consensus that people were excited and people enjoyed it. And now DC's and Warner Brothers is just like, okay, well, we'll see how this turns out in the movies. My question is, if, if they're adopting the Flashpoint, does this eliminate Jeffrey Dean Morgan as Thomas Wayne? Because that were the hints that we were getting since the Snyderverse started. And now if Michael Keaton's coming in to play his version of Batman again, does that um, exonerate, does that get rid of uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan possibly coming in? Well, we don't know. We we really don't know in what capacity Michael Keaton is going to be returning to this role, right? So, yeah. in the initial article in the rap, what they what they specifically said is that he's um, number one. They said that it's a very early phase yeah. of talks, so it could go either way. You know, yeah. it might work out. It might not work out. And, and he's probably, um, if he does take the role, he's probably gonna make more money now than he did 30 years ago. Correct, yeah. But money aside, we don't yeah. know like which Batman it's gonna be. We don't yeah. know that if it's Bruce Wayne, we don't know if it's Thomas Wayne, we don't know if it's an alternate Earth Batman, we don't know if it's Owl Man. We don't know, you know, all we know is that he is he's returning to the role. And so all everything else that we've heard um, aside from that, like, oh, he's playing Thomas Wayne, or he's going to play a mentor to the, the other heroes in these in future movies. All of that is speculation at this point. We don't know how big of a role this even is. Yeah. You know, um, it could be kind of, you know, men you mentioned Crisis. You know, everybody was super excited when we heard that Kevin Conroy was going to be playing a live action Batman after being the voice of Batman in the animated movies for so long. But then we get to that scene that he's in and it's literally just one scene, yeah. you know? And, and so, you know, for all we know, it could just be a short cameo like that. He might have a major role, he, he may not. And so until we hear, until we hear more, it's kind of difficult to kind of speculate as far as, you know, what it means for Flashpoint, you know, yeah. and what it means for possibly having uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan in the mix 
personally, I'd, I'd love to see him as as Thomas Wayne. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think you know that's that's it, it, talk about somebody. I think who he's really a better actor than just the Walking Dead guy. Oh he, yeah. Yeah, and I, I was a huge fan. Well, I'm a little biased because I'm into kaiju and video games, but man, in Rampage, he was really good. Right. Um, very, very underrated movie. Um, sure. But yeah, he's he's done good work, and I think. As far as Thomas Wayne goes, I think he nailed it out of the park. He's perfect for it. Sure. I mean, I mean Zack Snyder was, I know it was brief, but Zack Snyder was onto something when he picked him for that very brief uh, intro for Batman versus Superman. Right. Do you think that he had Flashpoint in mind when, when he did the casting? Maybe. I, uh, I, I want to say yes, because, I mean, before the. I think they had a, a huge um, story arc in, in in place at the time, right? So and and obviously fan demand is high, so sure. Yeah, now, maybe the, huge fan service, right? So absolutely. Now here's what's really funny is um, obviously the internet being the internet. Um, <laughs> the funniest thing I saw was the Oprah meme, um, where Oprah was like everybody gets a batman because <laughs> we got because we got ben affleck you know doing justice league the snyder cut and then we right. have rob pattinson and now the possibility of a um michael keaton now my main right. question is this is the one thing that no one's talking about do you remember uh when they first announced the hockey phoenix joker Right. And the way Jared Leto reacted to that news and how mm -hmm. angry and upset he was. Do you possibly think that Warner Brothers is, I don't know, maybe a little concerned about Pattinson's Batman and maybe this is like a, you know, like a backup plan in case the uh, Matt Reeves Batman falls on its face? I don't know if, I don't know about that. Um... I mean, we know that Warner Brothers have, has a history of being reactionary, right? Yeah. But I think that some of these moving parts have been moving for a while, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know that necessarily that that they would care about that. You know, like it, Jared Leto being, ups why would that matter? You know, like Jared Leto's not going to be in any upcoming projects that we know. So why would why would it matter to them? whether or not he was upset about, you know, being the Joker or, you know, uh, you know, uh, wh why am I blanking on the guy's name? The guy that's going to play Batman, Pattinson, Pattinson. Robert Pattinson. Yeah, Pattinson. I don't know that they are necessarily worried about rocking the boat with Pattinson because it's a completely different storyline. Yeah. Um, as far as we know, it's a standalone film. They're not really talking too much about franchise stuff. So I don't I don't think that that's really the case. I think well, I really I mean, personally I'm not bothered by it. I mean I, I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of the DC lore where I understand there are multiple universes and this this and that. And I think Joker going back to the Joker thing. I think Joker, you can make the argument is maybe that was Warner Brothers testing the waters to see how people would react to a standalone separated you know DC film. I see what you're saying. So what you're saying is that you think that the standalone Joker was like a test of like, let's not do shared cinematic universe. Let's just yeah. break off and do these 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 other um, standalone. Let's still continue the continuity but of still the other. Right, still can still continue the D the traditional DCEU continuity and just have these sort of else world stories. Yeah. And I guess that that's possible, right? That that. I'm Makes just wondering, is, is the general audience there yet? Do you think the general audience will understand, okay, this is a different Joe or a different Batman. This is a different blah, blah, blah. I mean, do you think we're there yet where the general audience is not going to get confused? Well, well, wait a second. I thought Michael Keaton was Batman. Wait a minute. What about Rob Pattinson? What about Ben Affleck? Do you, do you think the general audience is like ready for multiple takes on the same character going on at the same time? Well, absolutely. I mean, if if you, you know, if you really look at how the DCEU or actually how all the DC properties across all media, how they work, I mean, they there's there doesn't seem to really be any confusion. Like right now, there are two flashes, right? So yeah. we've got Grant Gustin on TV. We've got um, Ezra Miller in the films. 
we've had multiple Batman, you know, multiple Batmen over the past, say, 30 years, with the reboots being very close to each other. Yeah. You know, so I, I don't think that there's any thread of confusion where people are like, well, wait a second. You know, why are there two Batman? Why are there two Jokers? Or, you know, it, it hasn't seemed to bother them, you know, before now, you know, so I don't think that that's really going to be a factor. I think what they're really trying to do is, is build, you know, trying to repair, you know, as best they can some of the, some of the flops that they've had and yeah. try to get their bearing as far as the traditional DCEU. But I think at the same time, they're trying to build on the success of the standalone Joker, right? So you have, you know, a film that's not necessarily a, a traditional comic book movie sort of transcendent of that. So, you know, what if you created a Batman movie that was similar to that? You know, what if you created, you know, you know, down the line, you let's say you did like a, a Superman movie or, or something like that, that was completely separate of the timeline that we know that's maybe a little more grounded, a little more serious. So that's really what I think their plan is. Yeah. Oh, well, it's exciting times we're living in. Absolutely. Um, now, what's interesting about um, going to an easy transition here is <laughs> the rumors that we're hearing is that, I know we you touched base on it earlier, but I also read somewhere that the that this version, this Michael Keaton Batman is in fact the Tim Burton Batman 30 years later, ignoring the Schumacher films, which we have to get into now is um, this week we did receive the sad news of um, uh, Joel Schumacher passed away at the age of 80. Right. Um, now real quick, um, as as a lot of people who disliked Batman for by the way Batman Forever just came out 25 years ago like last week but as people much people like dislike Batman Forever and Batman and Robin um I don't put a hundred percent blame on Schumacher and it's just it's just really sad that um after Schumacher passed away I, I really dove in and looked at his filmography and I'm like, like right. wow talk about a filmography that he had and it's just a damn shame that that in the last few years that he's oh that's the guy that ruined batman that's the guy that ruined batman but not exactly but no one talks about his other great work and um and again like i said those two those two particular batman films again i think that was more so warner brothers wanting to sell toys yes i agree with that so you know and and i'm glad that you bring that up because i think that i'm, I'm probably one of the few people that that does recognize that, right? So, you know, whenever we hear the name Joel Schumacher, the very first thing that we hear is, oh, Batman and Robin, this guy like totally ruined a great <laughs> franchise, you know what I mean? And I'm no fan <laughs> of that movie. Like, I think that, you know, I think it's probably one of the worst, if not the worst comic book movie to, to ever come out. Um, but no, I also- there are worse ones out there. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are, right? there, there probably are. But you know, it's it's definitely down there at the, at the bottom, right? Yeah. But I also acknowledge that every director has, as John Campion would say, a bad day at the office, right? So, you know, you can't, you certainly can't uh, discount any of this guy's successes. I mean, yeah. you know, he gave us some of the some of the most iconic movies of the '80s. You know, he gave us Saint Elmo's Fire and mm -hmm. The Lost Boys. Yep. You know, uh, DC Cab. Uh, you know, even in the '70s, and you know, he was involved in some of the '70s hits, like you know, like Car Wash and some of the some of the some of the older uh, hits like that. You know, um, and even past the '90s and past, you know, the early 2000s, we get like yeah. films like Phone Booth. You know, which I think I loved Foam. Fantastic movie. You know, this guy did uh, also did you know a bunch of great music videos. He did you know did videos mm -hmm. for Seal for yep. like, Kiss, Kiss by a Rose. Right. I mean, so I remember in know, 1995. That's all that was on MTV was that damn video. I mean, Batman right. Forever was a hot movie. At the time. <laughs> it was. You know, and that, partially that because music of that video, song. Yeah, but yeah, like I said, that music video was all over MTV. Um, right. Being a '90s kid, that was like one of my fond memories of uh, MTV. Was was you know when it played music, and that was that's, right. one, that's one part of MTV I clearly remember. You know, I was like eight, nine, ten years old at the time, but that's one you know part of MTV I clearly remember. 
Right. Um, and that's cool that uh, Schumacher was behind a lot of those, some of these iconic music videos. Right. And, you know, and that is his real legacy, right? So when you kind of like take a look at the amount of great films and great projects that he was a part of, then yeah. you really get a sense of loss for the film community, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, of, of course it's sad when, when anybody passes, whether they were yeah. a good director or a bad director or a good actor or a bad, a bad actor, but he truly was one of the great ones. Yeah, and, and so, another thing too is um, I never heard anyone say anything bad about working. Everyone who's worked with Schumacher has said nothing but great things. Right. I never heard anything negative. I didn't hear any sketchy, ain't nothing sketchy. He's, he's treated everybody very well. Um, Everyone that's come out and talked about Schumacher's has said nothing but good things about him. That, that makes that makes me happy to hear that you know he wasn't difficult to work with. He, you know, he didn't he didn't do anything you know sketchy or anything like that. He's actually a, a, a genuine person to work with, and you know he tried. And you know, like I said, not every movie was a hit, but he tried his best. You know, right? You know, I mean, he you know for you know as far as as far as you know you know 80s and 90s hollywood and even early 2000s hollywood i mean he more often than not knocked it out of the park i mean he oh, yeah. was one of the he was one of the great directors of his time and he will definitely be missed i i think i'm gonna give you three movies that um again there are three movies that i haven't seen but there's but from the movies i've seen i'm gonna pick my three personal favorite starting with fan of the opera um it's very, very rare. I'm not a musical guy. Uh, right. I mean, there are exceptions out there, Grease and a few, couple others, but for the most part, I'm not in the musicals, but I loved Schumacher's take on Phantom of the Opera. I thought he knocked it out of the park. There were some moments where I cried. He captured the, he captured the live show, captured the emotion. Um, visually, I thought it was fantastic. I, I put that as one of my uh, favorites. Number two, uh, probably, now listen, I don't know how this film would go over nowadays, uh, but the movie Falling Down with uh, Michael Oh Duncan. yeah, wow, yeah, I love that movie. Whew. Talk about a disturbing movie, borderline comical, but very disturbing. And what goes on in that movie, again, I don't think would fly in today's culture, but <laughs> watch that movie. <laughs> and then for my number one pick, um, a time to kill with Matthew McConaughey and Sam Jackson. He did that one. I wasn't yes. aware. Wow. Yes. That and is... Matthew McConaughey credits Joe Joe Schumacher to launching his career. Right. Those who have not seen this movie, I say to you this: you probably heard of it at some point. Dave Chappelle made it famous <laughs> <laughs> with the Sam Jackson beer skit. <laughs> yes, they deserve to die, and I hope they burn in hell. <laughs> and I, now listen, I, I saw the Dave Chappelle skit long before I watched that movie. Right, right. And I'm watching that movie, and when, when that line came out of Sam Jackson's mouth in the courtroom, I burst it out laughing. I'm like, that's where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't realize that that's where that, that no! came from at the time? I did not realize that. Oh, wow. I, I saw that movie after the, you know, the Chappelle shit was what, was, I was in high school when that came out. So I right. didn't. I didn't see the see that movie slipped past me, sure. and I finally watched it not that long ago. I maybe saw it maybe like maybe four or five years ago. Okay. And, and like I said, I wasn't ready for it, but as soon as that part <laughs> in the courtroom came, and you know Sam Jackson's getting interrogated by uh, Kevin Spacey's character there, and he's just like, and he's like, yes, they deserve to die. And I'm just like, oh, wait, wait, what? Right. And that that's okay. Well, that's where that came from. So yeah, and uh, and, and I have to. But that's, it's, I mean, outside that one moment that where, you know, of course, you're going to laugh because Chappelle, Chappelle made it more famous. But outside that one part of the movie, it's a very emotional driven, very disturbing movie. And it's done so well. Um, Got to be one of McConaughey's best performances. It really right. is. Right. Um, and again, I did not realize Schumacher directed that movie until, you know, just the other day, you know. Well, Maybe knowing that, that, I got to revise my top three. Right. So, <laughs> so that's definitely up there because I, you know, that, that shows how much homework I did on the guy. So, yeah. So I had no idea that he did that. And that actually is, 
you know, a, a favorite of mine. You know, I, I've seen that, well, I watched it when it first came out in the theater. And then, you know, over the years when it's been on cable and, you know, when I come across it on TV, I'll stop and I'll watch it again. So that's definitely one. Um, and then the, the, the two movies that I mentioned from the 80s, I think are, are they remain my favorites of his. So St. Elmo's Fire, yep. you know, and, uh, and the Lost Boys, Lost Boys, you know, anybody who was, you know, a teen or a preteen at that time, I know that, that you're probably a little too young to yeah. remember this. I was or maybe born in the 80s, so I, I have to go back and watch those. So. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you, you know, I was 13 when that movie came out and, you know, it was the movie to see that summer. And, you know, everything from the cast to the story to the soundtrack, everything about that kind of came together in a very big and very 80s way. And at the same time, there's something very timeless about it. So, yeah. you know, here we are, you know, 35, 36 years later, you can pop that movie in still and, and enjoy it, you know, for what it is without, you know, thinking that it's cheesy or, you know, over the top or whatever. It's it's sort of the epitome of, of what a good 80s kind of action slash horror slash fantasy yeah. movie would be. So I think that's three. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and like I said, just, just to reiterate to everybody is, again, he's done a lot more movies than you realize, not just Batman and Robin. He's done a lot more than you realize. And... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's never too late to go back and watch the films if you haven't already. I highly recommend you do that. I might do that myself this week. There we go. So, speaking of, uh, you know, kicking back and watching, you know, movies and, and watching TV and stuff like that, um, you and I have been talking about uh, season two of Doom Patrol. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for those who don't realize, uh, season two of of this show uh premiered a few days ago on hbo max and dc universe yep i'm a huge fan of the show i've been watching it uh since it premiered and oh, yeah. even before that uh hmm. growing up i was a fan of the comics so i feel a certain way about this series in general and i feel a certain way about season two but before i kind of get into that i kind of wanted to uh kind of see what you thought of it um, no, I got the one episode on Thursday night um, when it premiered, and um, I mean, I may have made the mistake. I mean, I watched Doom Patrol from start to finish, and but the thing is, I, I probably should have at least rewatched it or at least watched a recap. Um, it it just seemed. I think uh, I'm not gonna lie. I really wasn't blown away by the uh, first uh, season premiere. Right. Um. Again, some of some of the decisions on the show, for example, um, I'm a huge cyborg fan, but I just feel I, I still feel that cyborg is out of place in the show. Um, right. I really thought he would be more appropriate in the Titans. Now this is the same universe as Titans. I feel right. like it would. I mean, we already have a robotic character. I don't know why we have to have two robotic characters. I just I'm just scratching my head a little bit. Um, I mean, it's still. Uh, it's still a fascinating watch though because it's very adult oriented it's very uh, it's very dark and somber and uh um the chief's daughter definitely adds new element to the show but it's still um i think it was a kind of a slow launch for to start right you know and and i kind of agree with that so i'm a huge fan of season one i mean I was in from the first scene or the first yep. episode. Um, and, did you, it, and you watched the Titans episode that had Doom Patrol in it. That introduced them, okay. and, yeah. which by the way, you know, I'm not a tremendous fan of the show Titans, but that particular episode I loved. And that's what kind of got me excited for the show. So when I started yeah. watching the show, I got hooked on it right away. I was very excited uh, to watch uh, this season. And I've gotten uh, maybe three episodes in, and I have to say, it's just, it's not doing it for me. There's there's a lot missing, in my opinion. Yeah. I was thinking about this earlier today, like why does the pacing of this and the energy of this uh, season feel so different? And I think I can, um, I think it boils down to 
the tone, the overall tone of the of the season. You know, in season one, you know, the, the whole thing is narrated by the main. Yeah. Film, you know. Oh my God, you're right. I did not. That's that's one thing. Yeah, it doesn't have that that, that narration. You're right. Right, and he's noticeably absent here. Now, I, I I know that they defeated him at the end of of season one, and I'm not going to give any spoilers as far yeah. as where he is now, but um, but but his absence kind of um, strips the show of some energy, you know, yeah. and it kind of makes it less, a lot less interesting to watch, you know. Um, I'm not big on the the main character for this season. I, just in general, I just don't think he's like a very interesting, um, you know, uh, character to kind of, you know, he's not a very interesting nemesis in general. It just kind of seems kind of silly, you know, and I know that, that the show, the, the point of the show is that, you know, it's it's embracing the silliness of the comic, right? It's yeah. embracing the, the sort of satire of, superhero fair right but there's just something about this particular um villain this particular rogue that i'm just like it's it's not that interesting yet hopefully it gets better in subsequent ep episodes but the one the, the the one or two episodes that i've watched so far have just really not pulled me in the way that i expected yeah i mean we can only hope that the show gets better um you know, it's it's still like I said, it's still a kind of a fascinating watch. And the thing, and then for those who are not into Doom Patrol or maybe they're not familiar with the characters, that's okay. I think one of the big drawing points of the show is this is the show that got uh, Brendan Fraser out of retirement. Right. So if any of those who want, if any of those who are wondering what Brendan Fraser has been up to or miss Brendan Fraser, should probably watch the show because I think he's one of the um one of the big moving parts of the show right i mean and and that is one piece of of this uh of this series that i still really enjoy right yeah. so you know the big the big part of of his character for anybody who who hasn't watched it he plays a character named cliff steel who um you know he was in an accident and you know, lost his family and lost his own body. And uh, the way that he's kind of saved is he, he's his brain is put into a, a robot. So he has and it's no- well done. It's, it's, it's half practical and half CGI. It's actually, right. it's really cool how they do it. It's pretty well done and it's pretty close to, to the representation in the comic, in the, in, you know, in the source material. Um, I really like his portrayal and I like where they're going with this character as far as, you know, his inability to physically feel things yeah. sort of exacerbates his ability to emotionally feel things. Yeah. And, I, and, and I think that that is one of the most interesting parts of the show. You know, yeah. it's, it's really, if I really think, it, think about it, it's probably the only thing that is really keeping me interested because I kind of want to see you know, where things, you know, where things end up, you know, like he's, yeah. you know, he finds out, you know, I, I don't want to give any spoilers or anything like that, but he finds out a huge piece of information, he acts on it, and yeah. I kind of want to see where things end up with that. Absolutely. All right, so, uh, you know, it's getting close to wrapping this up, but there's, uh, I figure we'll squeeze one more topic in. And uh, again, just to reiterate, Movies have been shifted again, again, a couple of weeks, <laughs> but we did get a couple of trailers, and one of them being the new trailer for The King's Man. Now, for those who are not familiar with The King's Man, King's Man is the third Kingsman movie, but it's a prequel. And now, the first Kingsman movie is fantastic. Um, it's Matthew Peak Matthew Vaughn right there. If you're right. a fan of X Men First Class, you should definitely check out. Kingsman. Then the second one came out, and man, did it bring the franchise down. The second one definitely lacks the charm of the first film. Um, there are a couple funny. I mean, I thought John, Elton John was pretty funny in it, but it's just, it's just a tad bit out of place. And then when we found out, I uh, forgive me, I can't think of the actor's name, but the main character of Kingsman made it, said that he's not coming back for the third movie. So I'm like, Taron Egerton. Okay, yes. And I'm like, well, how the, well, well, what is he gonna do? Um, 
what are they gonna do without him? But then, then we found out the third, and then we saw the third movie is gonna be a prequel. And then lo and behold, we saw that first trailer with, uh, and I'm a huge Black Sabbath fan. We got that trailer that the World War One setting, and they had a remix of uh, War Pigs. Yes. And I got hyped up. I'm like, listen, I wasn't asking for a third Kingsman movie or, or a prequel, but I saw that first trailer, I was amped up. And now the newest trailer just premiered this week. And this time they are uh, keeping the theme with um, a classic rock song being remixed. Um, uh, Edwin Starr's War, which was made famous, you know, 30 years later on Rush Hour. Um, they remixed War in the trailer. And it was like, oh, my God, this is and I'm like, I'm getting all excited. And they're showing the, 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 the fight, the fights and the, and the plot. And I'm just like, oh, my God. This movie looks great, and they said it's going to be September, and I am excited. Yeah, I, I was excited. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, here's my, so here's my take, right? Because, you know, like you said, you know, there are a stream of, of movies, a plethora of movies that were intended to come out, you know, a few months ago, sometime last year, sometime two years ago. Um, Kingsman was one of those films right so its initial release was november of 2019 when when they came out with the initial trailer for it i was a hundred percent in because the tone of it was so different than the rest of the kingsman franchise in fact yeah. that that teaser trailer didn't give you any indication of what it was until the very end. It was like this serious period piece, uh, you know, like oh, that's all you found out was that it's, it was, you know, it's based in World War I. And these well, guys... the only thing is with 1917, um, you know, recently just came out and now here we have this, this Kingsman movie prequel. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's becoming, right. It's, be, it's becoming a pretty popular trope. Like even, you know, going back a couple of years with Wonder Woman, right? Yes. Yeah. Based in World War One, but that but that that initial trailer, it it just basically looked like a World War One epic, and it looked like something that was a little darker and a little more serious in tone. And then you don't find out until the very end that that last scene where they're right in front of the Kingsman Taylor shop, and you're like, oh wow, this is like an origin story. This is yeah. I'm a hundred percent in on this, right? So I was excited for it to come out at the end of last year. Then they came out with the second trailer. It kind of gave, gave a little bit more uh, backstory, you know, introduced Rasputin. Uh, it still looked a little bit over the top, but I was like, okay, well, it's a Kingsman movie. The first one was over the top, but it was great. Yeah. Now, this, uh, the, more, the most recent trailer, it, it's even more in my opinion, it's even more campy than than the first two, and it makes it feel like okay, this is this is basically the Golden Circle, but set in 1917. You know, so is it going to be that film? I don't know, mm -hmm. but you know, I, it definitely made me less excited. It kind of like deflated my hopes for for the film. I mean, I'm still gonna go watch it when it comes out, but am I as amped about it as I was, you know, in fall of last year? Definitely not. All right, all right. I, I, I disagree, but I'm, <laughs> I think part of me is just, I think it's just because I'm so starved right now for sure. new releases. I think we all can agree to that. But, and again, the, 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 the time from the very first trailer to the trailer we just got, it was, it was months and months and months in between. So I, yeah, I think this is. I think this movie was just uh, just a reminder. Hey, there's a third Kingsman movie prequel coming out, and I guess it's just. I think I just kind of forgot about the first trailer, and then this one kind of <laughs> got me excited again. No, I'm with you. I'm I'm with you on that. And like I said, I mean, these are kind of, you know, I guess you could say they're unfounded fears, right? So, you know, it, number one, you know, I still have a very bad taste in my mouth from the Golden Circle. I really did not like that film. Yeah. No, I you know th that and then if you think about you know the timeline of you know the suicide squad movie you know how the original trailer was very serious very mm -hmm. dark super yeah. interesting you gotta you gotta feel that this was going to be 
a, a special type of film. And then the second trailer came out and it was absolutely ridiculous. And then the film yeah. turned out to be ridiculous, right? So, it, you know, it, and, and I know that you kind of feel a different way about it, yeah. but I, I really didn't like that movie very much. I, I'm, I'm kind not of going to defend the movie, but it's just, sure. I enjoyed now, it. I'm interested in seeing the air cut. I'll say that much. I'm interested in seeing what his cut looks like. Yeah, absolutely. I'm feeling it's going to be similar to what that trailer gave us, right? Yeah. I, and I kind of feel like, you know, my worry with with Kingsman is that we're going to get a repeat of that. So maybe there was a cut that was, you know, super um, grounded and 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 went. A specific well, something just way. dawned on me. Kingsman was a 20th Century Fox movie, right. and then the Disney merger happened. That's right. I'm wondering because that that they filmed that movie long before the merger, so that so that does raise some questions. With now Disney having their hands on it, um, well, I mean, just because just because uh, Disney has their hands on it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to make it family friendly or they're going to make it. You know they're going to kind of censor it or anything like that yeah. it's, not, it's not like it's part of the mcu you know yeah. it's i don't i don't really think that yeah but remember the first two movies were telling us 20th century fox sure um so I'm, I'm wondering like is this new movie still gonna be in the tone you know and you know that not dark but like well i'll, I'll put it to you this way the first the first two movies especially the second one were definitely not family friendly whatsoever and <laughs> and <laughs> if there's any of those elements in this third movie like that would not fly by disney just saying well again i mean it's i mean you know disney has put out you know content that isn't necessarily on par with with some of their family friendly properties you yeah. know and and i think that um you know with with properties like this one and like Deadpool and things like that I think they're gonna remain on brand I think they're I think that it makes that remains sense to be for them. seen you know yeah, yeah I could be a hundred percent wrong but I think that you know if they're really looking at the numbers and looking at what makes those movies hit movies you yeah. know it, it would be suicide for them to just kind of switch gears and be like okay well we want to make it more PG so that like kids can go you know to these movies because number one like small kids aren't identifying with these characters to begin with there's yeah. no kingsman cartoon right there's no like toys of eggsy or you know any of yeah. the other you know any of the other characters are in in that franchise so i don't really see them doing anything like that my worry is more that it's going to be a bad edit like they like they i have a feeling that they went back that they, they use this extra time to kind of go back to the drawing board and recut certain things and change yeah. the tone of the film and i think if they do if they've done that then i think they do a disservice to to the to the franchise and what this prequel could be yeah. i'm hoping that's not the case but in the back of my mind that's kind of what i think is going on oh we'll have to wait and see well well Again, uh, they're saying September is what the trailer said, um, but that could change in a drop of a hat. As you know, everything going on in the world right now, my dog's waking up right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there he goes. Okay, so <laughs> I guess that's the sign. I think my dog waking up is the sign. Hey, wasn't he in now. Call of the Wild? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, that was Buck. This is Lars. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess we'll wrap this up. So uh, we, uh, before we go, we ask you to pretty please like, comment, ring that bell, spread this shit like syphilis. So to you, I say, from Louisville to Syracuse, to our friends and fans around the world at Nerd Cage Live, enjoy life, stay safe, and good night. Sayonara. Ooh, trying to get out of the Nerd Cage, are ya? Well, before you go, Hit that subscribe button! And if you're really intrigued, ring that bell! Thank you for dropping by. Until next time, tell everyone you know about Nerdcage Live! <laughs>